All right, so let's go ahead and get started. OK, so we, at the end of the first lecture, we had already talked about the, uh, three of our empirical tools. We talked about the gold standard of randomized experiments, which is the case where we'd flip a coin and decide whether you're in the treatment group or the control group, and your assignment to being treated would have nothing to do with who you are, right, and nothing to do with your characteristics. Um, we talked about time series data, where we examine how two series move over time. Right, we talked about the problems of time series, namely that uh, in the case of time series, there are confounding factors, right? There are other things changing over time that could be either moving one or the other series, or maybe both series, right? And so we can't control for those time varying factors, and so the time series is sort of often difficult to draw strong conclusions from. We would also talked about cross-sectional data, where we're comparing across people in a single uh, unit of time, in a single period of time. And we said that the flaw to cross-sectional studies is that um, individuals have sort of an unobservable, individual-specific factor, right? And that if that relates at all to productivity or the x's or the y's, you know, we're not going to be able to sort of disentangle how much of um, whether sort of our x variable is driving our y variable or if sort of they're both uh, caused by this unobservable individual-specific individual characteristic. I think we talked about calling it spunk, right? If there's sort of a, you know, you are industrious, thus, thus you are very productive in the office, and you actually like to work a lot of hours, right? We could sort of see this confounding factor that's the individual-specific, unobservable sort of um, component that's driving both of those. There's the flaws with like time series, the flaws with cost section. So what if we put them together? What if we were able to, able to actually see people over time the same people, right? We would be able to look at them over time, and thus we'd be observing the same person with the same individual specific factor, and we'd get to see different people over time, right? So we have, we'd sort of get rid of the, um, the problems of both of these, and that's the idea behind panel data. So uh, panel data with quasi-experiments is the notion that um, having two-dimensional data sets, so different people over time, and combination with a quasi-experiment, which is sometimes called a natural experiment, which is sort of unlike our lab experiment, right, where I flip a coin and I decide whether you're in the control group or the treatment group, and then I expose you to UV radiation or whatever it is, and then uh, figure out what happens to you, right? That's the controlled lab experiment. We're actually going to use some kind of naturally occurring experiment. Um, an example of this um, that uh, could be uh, if we wonder, right, a question like um, what's the effect of military service on earnings, right, in later life? Most, most of the time, you know, people aren't, you can't just randomly assign people to the military, right? It's a voluntary force. People select into the military, and so there might be some individual specific component, right? Some unobservable individual characteristic that makes someone more likely to volunteer for military service and potentially more or less productive in the labor force, right? And we can't sort of compare cross-sectionally because of that, that selection problem. But there, you know, most recently people have sort of been selecting into the military, right? It's a, a choice. But there was a time not so long ago where it was kind of random, right? the draft lottery, right, of the Vietnam War. So an economist used the draft lottery to sort of look at the effect of military service, which was more likely if you had a low draft number, or if you had a draft number that was called, right, versus not, and looked at the effect of military service using the natural experiment of the draft lottery. Another natural experiment could be um, a charter school lottery, right, where the charter school for its own purposes runs a lottery to determine which of the students who apply to be in to, to go to the charter school gets a, gets a place. And then an economist could come in and use that lottery to then assess the effect of attending the charter school on educational outcomes or on um, juvenile crime or whatever outcome they wanted to study. These are natural experiments. Most, some of them are sort of random and naturally occurring, like, uh, like the draft lottery, or um, there's a study on the effect of schooling on earnings, where the authors use your quarter of birth as a source of natural variation. Because, um, so in most states, you can leave the school system on your 18th birthday. But, you know, if you're born in October, it means that you can leave very early in your senior year versus if you're born in April, where you get most of your senior year before you can drop out. And so they use your quarter of birth, which is sort of random about you, to, to, to sort of measure the effect of education on earnings, right? Because if you're born later, you get a little more education. It has nothing to do with you. It's sort of just a fact of when you were born. And they use that to sort of assess the effect of education on earnings. There are a million caveats, and if you want to talk about them, we can, you can come to my office hours, we can talk about them. Yes, quarter of birth may not actually turn out to be entirely random, right? Like people in different socioeconomic groups may differently time pregnancies 
and um, this is an estimate also that's coming from people who drop out of high school, right? This is not the average student in high school. It's an estimate that's based on the decision to drop out of high school or not. So there are lots of caveats, but that's another natural experiment. The natural experiments are most likely, most, most economists or most studies use, are policy natural experiments. That some state or some county changes a policy, and it has nothing to do with the people in that state, presumably. You know, it's not timed in any way. It just sort of comes into effect at that particular point in time. And you compare sort of the group that was treated, the group that was subject to the policy change before and after the policy change, compared to some similar group of people that serves as your control, and that's the natural experiment. Using panel data and such a natural or quasi-experiment, we can construct what is called the difference in difference estimator. So the difference in difference estimator simply takes the difference between the outcome after the policy change versus before the policy change for the treatment group, and compares it to the difference between uh, post and pre for the control group, and compares those two differences, takes the difference in differences, and constructs an estimate for the impact of the policy. Because what is the control group really doing for us in this situation? It's telling us what would have happened to the treatment group had it not been treated. It's providing us with a counterfactual outcome. Because we worry, right, if we just suppose compare the treatment group before and after the treatment, that's sort of like time series, right? Where we're sort of, there are lots of things that are changing over time that could affect the outcome we're looking at besides the treatment. We're using the control group as a stand-in for what would have happened to the treatment group in the absence of the treatment. The difference in difference estimator isolates the treatment effect from two things. From time trends, so common time trends between the control group and the treatment group, as well as time invariant individual characteristics. Because we're comparing the same treated group before and after the treatment, any individual specific characteristic will be netted out. That's the beauty of panel data. So if there's something about you that is fixed over time, when we compare you before and after the policy change, we're netting out that individual specific characteristic. As long as that individual specific characteristic isn't time variant, we're also netting out any common time trends between the two groups, right, as long as they're common between the two groups. That's what the difference in difference estimator will get us. So let's think of an example. Actually, let's look at a real example. So in 1997, the state of Arkansas cut its TANF benefit by 20%. It's cash welfare benefit. In Louisiana, benefits remained unchanged. I'm going to argue that Arkansas and Louisiana are fairly comparable states. They're you know, in the same region. They have similar sort of poverty levels. They have similar uh, traditions, and et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to tell you, Louisiana is a good stand-in for Arkansas. So we're going to ask the question, what was the effect of this policy change on labor supply? Our treatment group is going to be women who are affected by the, dis by the reduction in TANF benefits in Arkansas, i.e. single mothers, right? Those are the sort of main recipients of cash welfare. So our treatment group is, is single mothers in Arkansas. Our control group is going to be single women in Louisiana. The difference in difference estimator will show us how much of the labor supply of single mothers increased in Arkansas between 98 and 96 relative to Louisiana. Okay, let's go ahead and pull together some data. So this is some data on the average hours worked by single mothers in these two states in the two years. Recall the policy change happened in 1997. So we're going to compare a year after the policy change to a year before the policy change. So in 1996, women in Arkansas worked um, an average of 1,000 hours a year. Single mothers worked an average of 1,000 uh, hours a year. In 1998, they worked 1,200 hours on average per year. So women in Arkansas, single mothers in Arkansas, increased their labor supply by 200 hours on average. If we just compared the treatment group before and after, we would sort of erroneously draw the inference that uh, the change in TAN benefits led to a 200-hour increase in average hours worked. But let's see what happened in Louisiana. Over the same period of time, hours worked on average went from 1050 to 1100. So in Louisiana, there was this increase in the number of hours worked. If you think about it, it makes sense, right? 1997 was a time of sort of economic expansion. And sort of just comparing across time would confound the effect of the policy change with sort of the effect of the economic expansion, with the effect of various other things that happened, right? So we're losing Louisiana as a stand-in. So we're going to say in Arkansas there's a 200-hour increase, it, but in Louisiana there's a 50-hour increase. Presumably, when constructing this estimator, what I'm saying is that presumably Arkansas would have experienced the same 50-hour increase had we not had the policy change. So of the 200 hours that were worked extra on average in Arkansas, we're going to say 150 of them were due to the policy change, and 50 would have happened anyway, as they did in, Ar as they did in Louisiana. So we're going to take the difference across time for both of these states. So the 200 is 1,200 minus 1,000, the 50 is 1,100 minus 1050. We have 250 and then 200 and then 50, and we're going to take a difference again. 
We're going to subtract the 50 out of the 200. Our difference in difference estimator tells us that the increase in labor supply due to the reduction in TANF benefits was roughly 150 hours. Was 150 hours. The treatment effect, plus other things going on, is the time series comparison within Arkansas. Other things going on is what we get out of Louisiana. So subtracting off the Louisiana change from the Arkansas change, we isolate the treatment effect. That's the notion. So that's our interpretation, that the treatment effect of the, of the policy change was 150 hours. But are you 100% convinced that this is a causal relationship, that this policy change drove this hours increase? Maybe, maybe not, right? You'd want to see some more evidence. For example, you'd want me to tell you and prove to you that Louisiana really is a lot like Arkansas, right? Maybe, you know, one piece of evidence could be that, you know, in 1996, before the policy change, they were pretty similar, right? Single mothers seem to work very similar numbers of hours in these two states. But then again, you know, it could be true that these two states were on different trends during the 90s. Perhaps economic expansion affects, uh, well, I think of Louisiana as having sort of a, a strong fishing economy, right? Fishing and shrimping, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Arkansas has sort of um, a large kind of hog and chicken industry in Arkansas. So if somehow economic expansion in the late 1990s created differential sort of demand for seafood versus uh, poultry and the other white meat, right? we would see different effects in these two states over this time period. In other words, if these states are on different trends, Louisiana is in fact not a good stand-in for Arkansas. So you'd want me to prove to you that these, trends, these two, two states were actually on the same trend. And you know, you'd, you'd also ask, right? well, maybe Louisiana didn't change its TANF benefits, but maybe they changed their housing policies, or their childcare benefits, or their food stamp benefits, or their Medicaid benefits. You don't want me to show you that nothing else was going on during this period. Uh, question over here, Matt? I'm really pleased with myself. <laughs> Sorry. Wouldn't you also take into consideration the upward trend from like the previous year and maybe the like exactly. you, more hours each year anyway, so yep. that could have been the general trend. Exactly. So you'd probably, you know, if you're really going to construct this estimator, you probably wouldn't want to use one year before, one year and one year after. I mean, you'd want me to show you a chart of what was happening in these two states before to see how things were looking. Was labor supply expanding everywhere over this period of time? Was it expanding differently, right? Because if it's just expanding, if they're both expanding, then we're fine. Right, if they're both expanding in the same way in both, sta if both states are seeing greater labor force participation in the same way, that's exactly what the difference in difference estimator is doing for us, is Louisiana is telling us what Arkansas would have done without the policy change. The question is, were they really on the same trend before? And as Matt suggested, you want to see more, more years maybe plotted to show that the trends are very similar. Um, you know, you'd want me to show you that, you know, so this policy only should have affected people receiving TANF, right? Cash welfare, single mothers. Maybe you'd want me to do a falsification check we run the same regression, but we look at single men who typically don't get TANF, right? And we shouldn't, see this, we shouldn't see a difference in labor supply between these two states before and after the treatment, right? You want me to show you a falsification trust. You want to see more trend information. You want me to show you characteristics of women in these two states. Maybe Arkansas has a better community college system, and people in Arkansas are more educated on average, right? There's, there could be differences. You want me to sort of show you more data than I have about how good, because the question fundamentally is, is how good a stand-in for Arkansas is Louisiana? Is it telling us everything we'd want to know about Arkansas in the absence of this policy change? OK, that's, so this is, um, that's sort of what I'll hold you responsible for on the exams. This is like bonus extra fun. <laughs> so how many of you are taking STAT 2? Lots of you. Awesome. OK, so this is a regression approach to the difference in difference estimator. So I want to go back a couple slides for a second. Remember, Arkansas before and after gave us the treatment effect plus other stuff that was happening. Louisiana gave us the other stuff that was happening. Right? That's the other. That's the idea. So okay, let's look at this regression framework. Can you guys? Oh, you guys have it in front of you. Can you read it? Okay. Okay. So the constant is just going to give us sort of the mean. Okay. So our left-hand side variable is number of hours worked, I J T, by individual I in state J in year T. We're going to have a constant that's just going to absorb the mean number of hours right across the two states, and then we're going to have three variables. The first is a Arkansas dummy. It's turned on if the state you live in is Arkansas, if you live in the state that cut TANF benefits, the treatment state. Then we have a, a dummy variable Y, which is a dummy variable for it being 1998 in the post period. It equals 1 if it's a 1998 observation. It equals 0 if it's a 1996 observation. Similarly, the state dummy equals 1 if it's Arkansas. If this individual lives in Arkansas, if that observation lives in Louisiana, it's 0. And then our last regressor, our last variable, is s times y. So that would only be turned on if the individual 
lived in Arkansas and it was 1998, right? If it was Arkansas in 96, it would be turned off because the Y would be zero, right? And if it was Louisiana in 98, the S would be zero and that would be turned off. Okay, so let's think of a person, it's 1996 and they live in Louisiana. S would be zero, Y would be zero, interaction will clearly be zero. So none of the variables would be turned on in that case. So let's think of a woman who lives in Arkansas in 1996. What's the only variable that would be turned on? Which one would be equal one? Only S, right? Because 96, the Y is a dummy for being at post, for it being post 97, Y would be zero, and thus the interaction is zero. If it's a woman in uh, 1998 in Arkansas, all three would be on, right? Okay, got it. So I'm gonna tell you, if I wanted to know the average number, so the num average number of hours worked by a woman in Arkansas in 1998 will be the sum of alpha, right? Alpha tells us the average of everybody, plus the impact of being in Arkansas, so S1 is on, so be plus beta 1, plus beta 2, because it's a post year, it's 1998, plus the interaction, because that's on. The average number of hours worked in Arkansas in 1998 will be alpha plus beta 1 plus beta 2 plus beta 3. The average hours worked by a woman in Arkansas in 96, so alpha will be on, it's on for everybody, right? But in 1996, y is zero, so the interaction is also zero. So only thing on is beta one. So the number of hours worked by a woman in Arkansas in 96 would be alpha plus beta one. Similarly, a woman in Louisiana in 1998 would only have y turned on, right? So the average number of hours work she worked would be, uh, an average, the average number of hours worked by a woman in Arkansas in 1998 would be alpha plus beta two, because the only variable turned on, right, is y. And a woman in Louisiana in 1996 would only have alpha on, right? Because she neither lives in Arkansas nor is in 1998. We can construct our difference in difference estimator. Remember how we did it before? We looked at the treatment state, Arkansas, before and after the policy change. So we'd subtract alpha plus beta 1 plus beta 2 plus beta 3. We'd subtract alpha 1 plus beta 1 from that. What would we be, we'd be left with? Beta 2 plus beta 3, right? So just keep that sort of on the side of your mind. Let's difference out the Louisiana experience. Alpha plus beta 2 plus alpha is beta 2, right? Alpha plus beta 2 less alpha is just beta 2. What did we have over here again? What was our net difference? Beta 2 plus beta 3, right? Minus beta 2 gives us beta 3. So the treatment effect can be read off this regression by just looking at beta 3. Because that's the additional hours worked, right? That's the effect of being both a treatment state woman in the post period. 98 is on, Arkansas is on. The interaction variable will give us our treatment effect. You can construct the difference in difference estimator in this regression framework. What does this regression framework let us do that this sort of differencing system doesn't let us do? Could we, suppose we know things about the individuals in these states. Our panel data has stuff on like uh, their education levels and um, you know, their heights and et cetera, et cetera. We might want to control for that stuff, right? Can we do that in subtraction? No, right? There's no way to control for stuff in subtraction. Doing it in a regression framework, getting this treatment effect out of a regression framework, allows us to add a set of characteristics, add other variables to the regression. And that's the strength of using the regression framework. Have you guys covered this at all in stat two? Not really, right? Not, but you will, you will, you'll get to it. Um, so this I will not test you on. This is just fun and extra, uh, extra fun bonus stuff. But um, the, uh, the stuff before the slide, you will be responsible for. Okay, any questions about difference and difference estimators? We could even think of, this is difference and difference, right? We looked at treatment state, control state, before and after. But what was the group of people affected by TANF benefit ch changes? Single women with children, right? What if we compared single women with kids to single women without kids? They don't really get TANF, right? You have to have kids to get TANF. So single women with kids versus single women without kids in Arkansas versus Louisiana before and after the change. That would give us another level of control, right? Because we'd compare the labor market outcomes of single women, right? Instead of just sort of single women before and after, it'd be single women with kids relative to single women without kids. We control for another level of sort of, of variation. That would be called the triple difference. The difference in difference in difference, right? That's the triple diff. You could imagine there being a quadruple diff. I've never seen one, but you could imagine there being one, right? There's some other dimension, uh, you know, whatever it could be. Um, do you have a question up front? I'm sorry, your name again? Siobhan, that's right. Um, it's okay, whatever question you have, I assure you someone else has it. I guess I'm trying to grasp everything. I'm doing stat now. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, no, this is a great moment for it. But um, you said that S times Y yes. is the additional amount of hours. Is that the, the average hours worked by a woman that's both, right? That has both of these turned on. Turned on or off? Turned on. Both have to be one. On. Yeah. So. Because she's a woman in Arkansas right. in the post period. Were you already controlled for being a woman in Arkansas and being in the post period, right? That's what beta one, beta two are giving us. Right. It's being in Arkansas, being in the post period. The interaction gives us being both. The additional, the additional uh, hours of being both. So you're saying you don't need the beta, the other betas because the beta three answers the question. Beta three is all we're looking for. That's we need beta one and beta two because without them as controls, beta three isn't anything, right? So. Exactly. You're, exactly. Exactly. That's it? Okay, perfect. I'm glad you asked. Any other questions about this? Okay, let's go on to this lecture. So today we're going to talk about what I call deadweight loss, what some folks call excess burden. It's the same thing, but I just like the term deadweight loss. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the deadweight loss of taxation. We're going to talk about it specifically in the labor market context, how it affects labor supply. Then we're going to talk a little bit about optimal taxation in both the commodity space and the income space. OK, so the excess burden of taxation. We've sort of hinted at this before, but the excess burden of taxation, right, is the welfare loss induced by the imposition of a tax. Remember, markets don't take taxes lying down. Markets react to taxes. They, you know, there's an incidence question, which you've already covered. But markets are going to react to taxes by, reduce, by reachieving equilibrium, right? And they're going to achieve equilibrium at a lower level of quantity. We have our initial supply curve, S1. Let's say we levy a tax on the supply side. So our supply curve shifts to S2. Our equilibrium moves from A to B. We've talked about the price piece of this, right? We've levied it on suppliers. So they're going to pass part of the tax on to consumers by raising the pre-tax price, right, et cetera, et cetera. That's incidence, right? Incidence is about price. It's about equity. That's incidence. We're not going to talk about that stuff today. Today we're talking about efficiency. The efficiency loss due to this tax is the welfare loss because of preventing otherwise beneficial tra transactions from happening? All of these transactions, right? The initial quantity level was 100. The quantity level is now 90. All of these units, right? The marginal willingness to pay, which is the demand, which is demand, right? Lies above the marginal cost. So all of those transactions are beneficial to both the supplier and the demander. But because we've imposed the tax, we've raised the marginal cost of production. Those, trans those transac transactions will not happen. And the value of each of those transactions, the social value, is the difference between the marginal willingness to pay, the marginal benefit, and the marginal cost. The trade just barely to the left of equilibrium isn't worth that much, right? Because equilibrium is the point where sort of marginal benefit and marginal cost are exactly equal to each other, right? So the one just to the left of that is not worth that much. But the one, one over to the left, to the left, to the left, they get, they're more and more valuable, right? Because people's willingness to pay, right, is falling in quantity. So as we reduce quantity more and more, it's rising. Marginal cost is similar, right? Marginal cost is falling as we move further and further away. So the transactions that we're losing over here have bigger welfare costs than the transactions right near the equilibrium. The deadweight loss is the reduction in consumer surplus and producer surplus that is not going to the government in the form of revenue. Right? Because the old producer surplus was sort of everything above every, this big triangle. Right? The new consumer sur surplus is everything in the smaller triangle. It's above the line EB. So the loss in consumer surplus is this uh, shape, right? this, this shape FABE. Similarly, the loss of producer surplus right, is this shape GFAC, right? this shape. But this rectangle, this rectangle EGCB, what is that? It's government revenue. Exactly. No, perfect. Okay, it's government revenue. Exactly. It's government. It is the tax revenue the government is taking in. How do we see that? Well, it's the quantity that's sold in the post-tax equilibrium, 90, times that distance, which is the tax, 50 cents. So that's the amount of revenue the, governor, the government is raising from this tax. So while the change in consumer surplus and change in producer surplus is this whole area, this rectangle is going to the government as a transfer. But this piece of the lost producer surplus and consumer surplus is forever lost, 
right? That's not going to the government. That is just welfare loss. That is the deadweight loss of ta taxation. It is the loss per, per surplus that will not turn into revenue. Arthur Oaken, this economist from the 60s, used to sort of think of this as like a leaky bucket, right? So the point of taxation is to raise revenue, right, to do something else with it. But in the process of trying to raise revenue to do something with it, you lose more stuff than you can really transfer over to other purposes. So it's sort of like, like trying to tax this market and then use the revenue for something is sort of like trying to move water from point A to point B in a leaky bucket. A lot of the water is going to get there, right? That's the rectangle EGCB. That's the water, water that gets there. But some of the water leaks out of the bucket in route from point A to point B, and that's the deadweight loss. Right? So how effective a tax this is, or how good a bucket we have, depends on how much water is leaking out relative to how much water is actually getting there. Right? It's the revenue to, to deadweight loss sort of comparison that tells us how effective a tax is, how efficient a tax is. Any questions about this? So notice that the deadweight loss triangle, I like to think of it as the nose of the triangle points towards equilibrium. So if we were looking at a subsidy, which way would the triangle point? It would look like this, right? It would look like this. Its nose would point, would point the other way. OK. So that's the graphical way, right? Suppose I asked you to get, give me the area of the deadweight loss. How would you do it? It would be 1 half base times height, right? It's a good old-fashioned triangle. The height of this triangle is the tax, 0.5. What is the base? Change the quantity. It's 10. And then we multiply, we multiply those two numbers together and also multiply by 1 half because it's a triangle. Exactly. That's the graphical approach. There's also the analytical approach. You can actually give me the deadweight loss directly from elasticities. So I like this sort of this, this uh, form of the deadweight loss formula. It is exactly the same thing as what Gruber gives you in the textbook. And this is just some algebra to show you that they are equivalent. right? I like to put it in this, into this uh, sort of form, because then you can read it more easily. Because I'm going to ask you funny questions about it. So imagine that. Oh, so eta s is the elasticity of supply, and eta d is the elasticity of demand. Those little straight up and down lines just mean absolute value. Demand has a negative elasticity, right? Because demand slopes downward. But we're just going to use the absolute value. All you use that is the absolute value. OK, so suppose supply was more elastic. Eta s went up. How would the deadweight loss change? Let's take the step by step. Let's say eta s went up. Let's say eta s went from 2 to 3. Would the denominator be bigger or smaller? If, it, if eta went, s went from 2 to 3? Smaller. So the denominator is smaller. The deadweight loss is larger. larger, bigger. Exactly. So if eta s goes up, the deadweight loss is bigger. So if supply is more elastic, the deadweight loss is larger. The same thing is true for demand, right? When I say, when I say demand is, is, is eta d goes up, what I mean is in absolute value, right? I'm saying this, the curve is more elastic. The elasticity is going from like negative 2 to negative 3, right? That, to me, that's a, that's a bigger eta, right, in absolute value. So it's the more elastic demand or supply are, right, the bigger the deadweight loss. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because what is the sort of, uh, what affects efficiency? It's how much, how many transactions aren't happening, right? Elasticity is simply, simply means that for a given price change, we get a bigger quantity change i.e., if we impose the same tax in the more elastic market, right, in the market with the more elastic supplier demand curve, we'll have a bigger quantity decrease. The change of quantity will be larger. That makes perfect sense. More transactions won't happen. The deadweight loss will be larger. The deadweight loss is also a function of the tax. Here, tau, we're going to be talking about specific taxes in this class. So tau is something like 50 cents or $2 or whatever it is. So how does deadweight loss depend on tau? It's quadratic, right? Which means, suppose I double the tax, what's going to happen to the deadweight loss? It'll go up by, if I double the tax, the deadweight loss will go up by four times, right? Right, because it's quadratic. If I triple the tax, the deadweight loss will go up by nine times. Yes, exactly, as I heard it out there. OK, good, excellent. So I like this, I like this sort of notation. I like it in this form, because here, when you look at this beast and I tell you, ask you what happens when 8s goes up, it's not entirely straightforward to look at and tell me. right? That's why I rewrote it in, the, in these terms. So th that's the only reason um, I like this form better. OK, so let's go ahead and talk about the inefficiency. Of, um, yes, question. I, forget, I can't remember your name. Dima, right. Yep. 
Um, it's at the point we're examining. So it's at the point, the, like when I ask you, it's like at the tie point, like if we decide to levy a tax, what would the deadweight loss be? Does that make sense? Perfect. OK, so inefficiency of taxation. Measures of deadweight loss, first of all, um, Eric. For the exam, you can have cheat sheet with formulas, or we expect it to memorize the um, I don't expect you to memorize that. I'd probably just give it, like, I'm not going to give you a cheat sheet, but I'd give you the formula. Does that make sense? So I'd probably give it to you like this, and I'd expect you to know what A to S and A to D are. You'd have to remember that stuff and what tau is. And Q and P, I hope we don't have to work on. But yeah, so that's, uh, I would expect you to know what the terms are. I will always use eta for elasticities. It's sort of my notation. Um, if, I know some people use epsilon. If you choose to use epsilon, I will be able to understand as long as you tell me what it is. OK, excellent. OK, so just a few notes on the inefficiency of taxation. So when I talk about deadweight loss, I am simply talking about the loss of social welfare, the loss of producer and consumer surplus induced by the tax that does not become government revenue. Right? I'm talking about that triangle. There are additional costs to taxes. There's the cost of the government administering the tax, right? Printing out the 1040 forms and processing the returns, et cetera, et cetera. There's administrative costs, and then there's compliance costs. The time people spend filling out their tax forms, the time they spend, you know, way, whatever else they have to do, complying. Compliance and administrative costs are not in our debt weight loss calculation, but they are part of the burden of taxes. In the absence of barriers to price adjustments, statutory incidents will not affect the dead weight loss. Right? Who pays the tax, who bears the economic burden, does not affect the deadweight loss of the tax. Because remember, incidence, price is equity over here, quantity efficient, and efficiency over here. Quantity efficiency and deadweight loss over here. There's one little caveat. I mean, I want you guys to, to learn this stuff as separate, but there's something that we've talked about that affects both, both of these things. Who gets to escape a tax? Who gets to avoid the economic incidence of a tax? What's a, what, what, what kind of curve? Elastic curves, right? In markets that have more elastic curves, is the deadweight the dead loss is bigger. So they are fundamentally interrelated on some level, right? But I do want you to sort of, as you learn this, to keep them distinct. I don't want you to later be confused and be like, you told me they were separate, but they're actually kind of related. They are related. It's all, equal, equal, and all an equilibrium phenomenon, right? They're all interrelated. But I want you to sort of not get confused between prices and efficiency. Prices are about incidence and equity. OK. So in the absence of barriers to price adjustment, statutory incidents will not affect the deadweight loss. But in a situation where there is a barrier to price adjustments, either there's a minimum wage or there's a price ceiling, right? we've seen that statutory incidents will matter for economic incidents in those, in those situations. And in fact, we've seen that they, they can affect deadweight loss. Because remember the case with the, per, with the payroll tax last time and the minimum wage? When there was a minimum wage, and we put the tax on employers, remember? They were not able to lower wages as much as they wanted to in order to pass the tax on to their workers. So what was the result? Not, I mean, the, went the number of hours employed went even further down because they had to pay the minimum wage, right? They could not pass the tax on by lowering pre-tax wages by more. And so demand, firm demand, uh, demanders reacted by lowering quantity even more. So in the case where prices can't adjust freely, statutory incidents will, in fact, affect the size of the deadweight loss. That makes sense, right? We, that was an example from last week. OK. As we've seen looking at the formulas, deadweight loss will increase with supply and demand elasticities. Deadweight loss rises quadratically with the tax rate. And finally, pre-existing distortions to the market will affect the deadweight loss. If the market is somehow already distorted, Imposing a tax on that market will have a different deadweight loss effect than it would in a market that was not already distorted. OK, let's go ahead and look at a few different graphs. So this is sort of uh, for the same supply curves, right, and the same tax. S1 and S2 have the same slope in both of these graphs. And the distance between them is the same. The tax is the same. In a case where demand is much more inelastic versus where it's fairly elastic, the deadweight loss is going to be larger in the more elastic situation. Again, that's because for a given change in price, for the same change in the tax, right? elastic simply means that we have a bigger change in quantity for a given change in price. That's what more elastic means. And we know that efficiency is sort of measured by the, by the number of transactions that aren't happening. So the more, the more quantity reacts to a change in price, the bigger the inefficiency of the tax. Cool. 
So the deadweight loss rises quadratically with the tax rate. So when we impose, so let's think of a market where it's a gas, it's a gas market, it's a market for gasoline. So we have our initial 10 cent tax. Our initial 10 cent tax shifts our supply curve from S1 to S2, triggering the deadweight loss, BAC. Right, that's our initial 10 cent tax. Suppose we impose another 10 cent tax. We know, looking at this graph, I, you can tell me that the change in quantity from Q1 to Q2 will be the same as the change in quantity from Q2 to Q3. How can you tell me that? Because I'm imposing the same tax twice, they're both 10 cents. And what's true of these supply curves and demand curves? The slope is constant. The same price change will trigger the same quantity change no matter where we are, right? Because they're straight lines. In this class, you will always deal with straight lines. You won't deal with curves. OK, so you know that del uh, the difference between Q1 and Q2 is equal to the difference between Q2 and, Q and Q3, because these are both 10 cent taxes. But it's true that the deadweight loss of the second 10 cent tax is bigger than the first 10 cent tax. And that's because the first 10 cent tax is going to prevent these transactions from happening. And they're close to the equilibrium, right? Relatively close to the equilibrium. Those are transactions where the marginal willingness to pay is greater than the marginal cost, but not by that much, right? That vertical distance is smaller. As we distort this market further and further, we're preventing transactions that are of higher social value, right? The surplus derived from each of these transactions is bigger than those because they're further away from the equilibrium. The difference between marginal willingness to pay, i.e. marginal benefit, and marginal cost is bigger. And so the deadweight loss of further taxes is bigger than initial taxes. In fact, the deadweight loss rises quadratically with the tax rate. Questions about this? Okay. okay. So what are the implications from these two first points, these first two points, when we're thinking about how to design tax policy? Well, we can see, right, from this graph, we can see that if we have two goods, right, imagine they have the same elasticities. So when we're talking about how do things vary with the tax rates, we're going to keep the elasticities constant. When we talk about the elasticity, we're going to keep the taxes constant, right? We've done this so far. In this graph, when we looked at different elasticities, the taxes were the same, the two graphs. Here, we're comparing different taxes. We're talking about the same elasticity of, of supply, right? Okay. So if we have two goods, rather than taxing one, at 20% and the other at zero, if they have the same elasticities of supply and demand, we're better off taxing them both at 10%. Right? That's what we learned from the fact that deadweight loss rises quadratically with the, taxes, with the tax. So we're better off sort of not piling taxes onto particular goods, right? given the same elasticities. It's also true that it's not a good idea to try to raise a lot of revenue in a single period of time. So you know, government, government expenditures can be lumpy. For example, when we fight wars, right? There's a sudden need for revenue because we have a lot of expenditure, right? Expenditures fluctuate during wartime. But it doesn't make sense to try to pay for a war in all one year, right? Because it has the same principle as trying to tax one good rather than both goods. We're trying to tax sort of the economy in one period with very high tax rates. The deadweight loss will be very, very high because those tax rates have to be exorbitantly high in order to make enough revenue in just a single period, right? We'd be better off smoothing the tax increase over years, right? Rather than increasing taxes by 50 percentage points in one year, it's better to increase taxes by a couple percentage points over 20 years, right? That's the notion of smoothing. Jeff? Um, if you're going to tax two goods, mm -hmm. should they be substitutable or not? We're, that's going to be a level of discussion we won't get to in this class. Yeah, but it's because it's sort of there's there's distortions between them, right? But if that, honestly, if there's only two goods, they have to be substitutes. But, you know, but yeah, in a general in a more general context, yeah, we won't get into that. But uh, we can talk about it after class or during office hours. Terrific, uh, Allison. Um, I'm so, I'm so, is there an Allison? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Even in real dollars. So suppose we were already uh, def deflating the future into today's dollars, right? Even in that case. So, so let's talk about this in real dollars. I ignore, imagine we've already taken inflation into account. 
So suppose we need, let's see, uh, what, what do we need? We need, let's say we need uh, $200 billion for some, for some war that we were thinking about fighting, okay? Or we have fought and we need to pay for. Um, in that situation, right, it's $200 billion in 2012 dollars. So if we wanted to raise $200 billion, $200 billion 2012 dollars in 2015, we'd have to raise $240 billion 2015 dollars, right? So it's, with, if we just think about it, we're trying to raise $200 billion in real dollars, in today's dollars over time. We don't want to raise them all this year. So it's, a, it's sort of, um, the time value of money is sort of a red herring. It doesn't matter. We're going to do this all in real dollars. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, and we'll talk about, when you talk about deficits and debt, there's also other reasons why you might want to do it uh, over many years. Right? First, there's a tax efficiency reason, first and foremost. But um, you know, there's also sort of uh, benefit matching. Governments aren't, aren't cash flow economies, right? Uh, cash flow are sort of budget situations. When, you know, um, when, when the greatest generation fought World War II, one could argue that we're still benefiting from that today, right? Like a free Europe benefits us today, right? And so there's some notion of matching the benefits to the costs, right? So we should probably still be paying for it. We should, we should help pay for that war too, right? It would be very strange to have the example of the greatest generation fighting that war, right? And losing life and limb, and then also coming home and paying for the war, right? That's like a very, that's, that's sort of, that makes that, you know, there's a, there's a benefit that accrue over more than maybe two or three years to some enterprises. Um, but this is, that's not, that's not even, this, that's an issue for later in the term. This issue here is simply that we want to tax smooth. You want to tax smooth over goods, you want to tax smooth over time. Because sort of the economy in different periods is sort of, you know, like a good in a sense, right? Okay, it's, 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 it's like a tax base, right? You have tax bases of different goods in a single period of time. You have tax bases of sort of economic activity in different periods of time going forward. Okay, cool. Okay, pre-existing distortions. So, markets, are sometimes distorted to begin with, right? They're not achieving competitive, social optim socially optimal equilibria to initially. For example, there are markets where there are positive externalities. For example, the vaccine market, right, has a positive externality. In which case, so if there's a positive externality, what do we know about the private market? The private equilibrium is going to do what? Relative to the social optimum, this private optimum will under-provide the good, right? There'll be too little of the good provided relative to the social optimum. Because when private individuals make consumption decisions and producers make production decisions, they don't take the, pers the positive externality into account. They're gonna just look at their private benefit and, and sort of allocate their budgets accordingly. So the private equilibrium will underprovide a good with positive externalities. So there's already sort of a missing cue. If we impose a tax on a market that has positive externalities, we're actually going to exaggerate. We're going to have a bigger deadweight loss than we otherwise would. Because the good is already underprovided, we're going to be removing transactions that are even further to the left of equilibrium, of the socially optimal equilibrium. In the case where there's a negative externality, the deadweight loss will be smaller, right? Because in the case of a ne negative externality, for example, in the case of pollution, the private equilibrium is over providing the good, right? There's too much. Q is above Q star. The socially optimal quantity is Q star. The private market's going to overprovide it. There'll be too much of it. So if we're removing some Q by taxing it, we could, in fact, be drawing ourselves closer to the socially optimum Q star. We could overshoot it and have too little even relative to the social optimum. But in this case, the deadweight loss will be smaller right, than it would in a competitive, economy, a competitive equilibrium that's socially optimal. optimal. Finally, if there's this is sort of counterintuitive. Um, you know, so I think often the word monopolist has like a negative connotation, right? And we think, let's go tax those guys. But actually, in the case of a monopolist, what does a monopolist do? How does he keep prices high? Yes, he sets the quantity. And how, and relative to the competitive equilibrium, he underprovides. Yeah, he, he, he supplies less than a competitive equilibrium will. So there's already an underprovision of the good. If we tax it, if we tax a monopoly market, we're going to have even further reductions in quantity, and we're going to have a bigger deadweight loss than we would in a competitive economy, a competitive market product. Okay, let's take a few, like, look at a few examples. Okay, on the left is a market with no externalities, right? It's our good old graph. We start off at S1. We impose a tax on the supplier. We shift to S2, triggering deadweight loss BAC. On the right, we have a market with a positive production externality. 
So that means that, you know, this is our original private marginal cost curve, the dotted red line. The social marginal cost curve is actually below that, right, because there's a positive externality. The cost is actually lower, right? The social marginal cost is below it. But we then tax this good, right? So when we look at, so for, sorry, first let's look at the uh, positive externality. So this is the social optimum. This is the private, I'm sorry, this is the social optimum. This is the social optimal equilibrium. This is the private equilibrium. Relative to the social optimum, because the private market does not take the externality into account, it's going to underprovide the good. We're going to be at Q2 rather than the socially optimal Q1. We then impose a tax on this market, which shifts the private marginal cost from PMC1 to PMC2, to the solid red line. We're going to see a further reduction in quantity as the equilibrium moves from E to G. Our quantity, quantity will fall from 2 to 3. The socially optimal quantity is Q1, remember because the private market does not take the positive externality into account. It only supplies Q2 in the no-tax equilibrium. When we impose the tax, we get a further reduction to Q3. The deadweight loss from the positive externality not being internalized is this small triangle. When we impose the tax, we increase the deadweight loss to also include this trapezoid. If there was no positive externality, this would have been our deadweight loss. Our deadweight loss is actually bigger because there's already a missing level of quantity. Right? There's missing output relative to the social optimum. Okay. In the case of a negative externality, right, we can, we'd be discouraging excess production. Right? In the case of a negative externality, we think there's excess production, and we would discourage that by taxing it. That's sort of the notion of, sort of um, something that's called Pigouvian taxes, right? where you go after bads. You go out, uh, go out and tax things that have negative externalities. Like if you think secondhand smoke is a negative externality, cigarette taxes could be a Pigouvian tax. Right? It's exactly the same idea. Actually, um, there's, this, there's this bar, Pegu. It's like on Houston over here, right? My friends and all, I, for a long time, we're all, all my friends are economists. Um, yes, it's sad. Um, <laughs> for a long time, we used to call it Pegu, right? I, like Pegu, so Pegu, the Peruvian tax is named for this economist, Pegu. And we used to call it Pegu. And then we realized we're just willfully illiterate. Like, it clearly is P-E-G-U. And we were just refusing to read, right? We're just flat out refusing to read. And so we all call it Pegu, and it's totally wrong. But anyway. Yes, that's the notion behind a Pigouvian tax, is that there are bads, there are markets that have the overprovision of some bad thing, and we can sort of slow down or reduce that, pr that production by taxing that good. It's, it's, uh, there's, a, there's, actually a, there's also a Pigou club. Uh, Greg Mankiw, run, uh, it's like this club that Greg Mankiw started on his blog of the co economists who want to shift the tax base from like, income to bad things, uh, like pollution or you know, cigarettes maybe, or. I don't know, if we legalize marijuana, that would be something to tax, right, if there's negative externalities to that. Um, so various bad things. OK. OK, so taxes and labor supply. So OK, that's, that's what we're going to talk about when it comes to um, excess burden and dead weight loss. So I'm going to actually take a minute now for you guys to think for a second and see if you have any questions about this stuff. Yes, uh, Siobhan. No, no, it's great. I, I promise you, other people have them. Providing. providing. Because the social optimum is where social marginal cost equals social marginal benefit. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be point D. Right. The private marginal cost, though, is higher than the social marginal cost. And so the private market is Why? because there's a positive externality. So uh, let's say it's a production externality. Let's not do vaccines. That's like a demand side externality. Let's, let's say it's a production uh, externality. Let's say um, I am Intel, and when I make chips, I discover ways to make chips even better, let's say. And that's knowledge that I can't completely contain to myself. It spills out into other, other firms. As my workers leave and stuff, it spills into other firms. So it increases productivity more broadly than just my firm. So the marginal cost of producing this ch these chips is actually lower because I'm also producing this knowledge. But I don't internalize the benefits of all the benefits of that knowledge. Right? I can't keep them all to myself. And so I, you know, the marginal cost of my units of production is actually lower than what I think it is, because there's this sort of outflow of benefit. The cost. Yeah, that's the, that's like Intel's marginal costs. Like when I look, like Mar Intel's, like you know, when we make this chip, it costs us, you know, forty cents, and you know, we get some knowledge gain, but we only value that at three cents because two cents of knowledge gain slips out into the economy, say. Right, so they would say forty cents minus three cents, so our marginal cost is like thirty-seven cents, but socially it's thirty-five cents. Because there's this positive externality that they can't. Positive externality just means there's a spillover, a positive spillover to other parts of the economy that they can't capture all the benefits from, and thus they don't internalize. So when they're deciding how much to produce, 
two cents of that knowledge benefit is not something they take into account because they don't personally gain from it. Does that make sense? So that's what we mean by a, produ a positive production um, externality. I'm sure there's a simpler one that I've just not thought of. Um, but so that's why the social marginal cost lies below the private marginal cost. Uh, OK, does that make sense then? Any other questions about this stuff? Is that it? OK, then let's go ahead and talk about labor supply. OK, so the question we're really going to spend time on is how do income taxes affect labor supply decisions, affect the decisions as to how much to work? Well, like all, so when we, we're going to model the income tax as a wage tax. That's how we're going to model it. What is the wage? It's the price of what? Leisure, exactly. It's the price of leisure. Because when I decide to watch an hour of Law and Order, I'm giving up the opportunity to go work for an hour and earn a wage. In that sense, I'm paying that amount of money to watch that episode of Law and Order. OK, so wages are prices. They're the price of leisure. Of leisure. When we change prices, we trigger two effects. One is the substitution effect, and one is the income effect. The substitution effect arises from the fact that a price change leads to a relative difference in prices between goods, right? In this case, between consumption and leisure. The income effect comes from the fact that when you change a price, when you impose a tax, a person's income doesn't go as far, right? They can't buy as much leisure as they used to be able to, right? Like they're, that, they, that they are poorer now. And when people feel poorer, they buy less of everything, including leisure, right? So this is the way, these are the two channels by which um, taxes are going to affect labor supply. The substitution effect is going to lead the individual to want to work less, right? Because when we tax someone, let's say we impose a 25% tax, their initial wage, wage was $10. So the price of an hour of leisure was $10. Suppose we impose a 25% tax. What is the price of leisure now? $7.50, right? If their wage was $10 and we impose a tax, the price of an hour of leisure has fallen from $10 to $7.50. So that substitution effect, so leisure has gotten cheaper, right? So the substitution effect will lead this person to want to work. Leisure has gotten cheaper, so they're going to want to buy more leisure and thus work less. So the substitution effect of a tax increase will lead someone to want to work less. The income effect, though, right? So we've decided we've imposed this tax. They're poorer. They're going to buy less of everything, including leisure. So they're going to want to work more. So the income effect will lead them to want to work more. The substitution effect will lead them to want to work less. The net effect is actually theoretically ambiguous, right? It sort of depends on the relative magnitudes. For most people, we actually think that the substitution effect outweighs the income effect. That's sort of what we empirically think. And that actually makes sense, right? Because which way do we say the labor supply curve slopes, up or down? Up, like all supply curves, right? So let's think about the logic here. Suppose the income effect was actually bigger. Let's think about that for a second. So that would mean if I increase taxes, wages have gone down, right? If I increase taxes, net after tax wages have gone down. The income effect says you feel poorer, you buy less leisure, you work more. So that would tell, say, if the income effect was bigger than the substitution effect, it would mean that as I drive your wages down, you're working more. That would be a downward sloping labor supply curve. If that was bigger than your substitution effect always, that would be very odd, right? That would be a downward sloping labor supply curve. Because we think labor supply does slope upward, we, can, we sort of believe that the substitution effect outweighs the income effect for most people. But we do think that the income effect may potentially outweigh the substitution effect for people who work a lot of hours and have a lot of income. Because suppose you're working 3,000 hours a year and you have lots and lots of income. Let's say the difference between, suppose someone has $40,000 of income, and we increase taxes by 10 percentage points. How much income are they losing? $4,000, right? Suppose somebody has $400,000, and we increase taxes by 10%, 10 percentage points. How much income are they losing? $40,000. So the income effect gets bigger in dollar magnitude with more income, right? And so we think that there may be a level of income at which, or an hour's worked at which, the income effect starts to outweigh the substitution effect. So sometimes people call this the backward bending labor supply curve. It slopes upward most of the time, and then at really high levels of working and income, it starts to bend backward. Because any percentage change in taxes, that triggers a very large income effect. Because a percentage change in taxes translates into a large number of dollars lost. That's the idea. Eric. I just have a question out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. How would you apply that same analysis to industries that have sort of fixed income? 
Um, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so this, is, so this is one of the difficulties. So one of the things we look at, right, one of the things that we look at, and we'll talk about the empirics in a minute, is we're always interested, you know, when people, when taxes change, do people work more or less? The general answer is for most primary earners, the answer is they don't really change their hours. And that's partly because we think to some degree, you don't get to go freely choose your hours, right? Jobs come in certain sizes, full-time jobs, part-time jobs might have a little more variety to them, but full-time jobs are often of the flavor 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, right? They generally, I mean, sometimes you end up working more than that, I think, but that's the general size of, of salaried jobs. There aren't always free, you can't always, you can't always freely choose your hours. The question is maybe, you know, um, with salaried employees, you can imagine maybe the hours don't change as much, but maybe you work harder or less hard, and so your income changes, right? You're, you get promoted, you get unpromoted. And we also don't ask people, so I think often with salaried jobs, the general notion is you work 2,000 hours a year. You might be working more or less than that in reality. Right, so we ask people what their hours were last month in the surveys. So if I, you know, if you're really working 45 hours, right, that would be reflected. You would say 45. But no, there is this question that there are sort of frictions to changing your hours. It's very hard to go work 42 hours a week. Maybe you get a side job. Maybe that's one way you could get sort of extra hours, right? Or you could put it in for overtime. But again, that's, hour work. that's, that's hourly work. Salaried employees, I mean, this is a jobs come in certain sizes, but you would imagine that if there was a lot of demand to have changeable hours, like suppose, you know, taxes fell by enough that people really wanted to work additional hours, you can imagine jobs changing, right? Some people actually think that the U.S. workforce is now in this model where Salaries are kind of higher in some industries because they're not really 2,000 hours a week, a month, a 2,000 hour a year jobs, right? I mean, I think there's many of them here in New York. If any of your friends are lawyers, right, this would fall into that category. Um, there are lots of jobs like this. But it's salaried, but you're working a lot more than, than 40 hours a week for 50, work, for, for 50 weeks a year. So there's some movement. And we ask people what they actually worked rather than what the official uh, description is. Any other questions? Okay. So let's go ahead and look at a simple diagram of this. So our original budget constraint is the blue line. This agent's wage was $12.50 an hour. And they had a tangency point with their indifference curve at point A, where they were working 900 hours. We then impose a tax, such that the after-tax wage falls to $8.75 an hour. That is a shift or a rotation downward of the budget constraint. Because the number of hours they can possibly take for leisure has not changed, right? They still have the same number of hours in a day. That hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed is how much, how each hour of leisure translates into consumption. That's what the, the tax has done. It's reduced the number of consumption units they get for each hour of labor. So that's, so the y-axis intercept has changed and it's fallen. And we see this, we see, we show that by plotting the budget constraint as BC2. Let's look at two situations. A situation where the substitution effect is bigger than the income effect, and a situation where the income effect is larger than the substitution effect. Let's start here, where the substitution effect is larger than the income effect. So our person starts off at 900 hours, right, of leisure, working 1,100 hours, right, and they're at point A. We then impose this tax, reducing the after-tax wage to 875. We rotate the budget constraint in, and this individual finds a, a new equilibrium, a new tangency point at B, where their number of leisure hours has increased to 1,200. Instead of working 1,100 hours, they're now only working 800 hours. This is a situation where, in reaction to a tax, in reaction to a lower wage, the person is now working less. The substitution effect is one, right? Because the substitution effect, in this case, has reduced the relative price of leisure the relative price of leisure has fallen, and so the person wants to enjoy more leisure, demand more leisure, so they work less. There is an income effect here, right? Because this new budget constraint lies below the old one. It's just not large enough to offset the substitution effect. Remember, the income effect here is that they're poorer, so they're going to buy less of everything, including leisure, and thus work more. So the substitution effect is being offset to some degree by the income effect, but it's not being fully offset. The substitution effect exceeds the income effect, so an introduction of a tax on wages leaves this person to work less. Okay. 
Now let's think about a situation where the income effect is larger. So this person again starts off at point A. They're uh, enjoying 900 hours of leisure and 1,100 hours of work. We impose the same tax, but here the income effect, exce income effect exceeds the substitution effect. In other words, this person will react to the tax by in fact working more. The fact that they're poorer and will demand less leisure and work more is bigger than the fact that leisure exceeds the effect of the fact that leisure is now cheaper and they're going to demand more leisure for, from the substitution effect. Can, does everyone get it? Does everyone see it? OK, so things I would ask you on an exam. So suppose I gave you point A and point B on the left. And I, I might ask you if Bob reacts to the imposition of the tax by moving from equilibrium A to equilibrium B. Does his substitution effect exceed his income effect, or does his income effect exceed his substitution effect? You would look at this, right? You would look at this graph and say, well, you know what? His leisure hours went up in reaction to a tax, i.e., he's working less. That tells me his substitution effect is bigger, right? That would be something you could infer. It could also be, you know, I could give you, suppose I didn't give you point B or the indifference curve, right? I just gave you point, the, indif the blue indifference curve and point A, and I drew the red budget constraint, and I told you, We've imposed a tax. The new budget constraint is BC2. For Bob, the substitution effect exceeds his income effect. What could be a new tangency point on BC2 for Bob? And you could then draw a tangency point anywhere to the right of 900, right? Because the substitution effect exceeding the income effect just tells you it's going to react to the imposition of the tax by working less. Cool. So those would be sort of exam type questions. OK, let's talk about empirical evidence. You guys have alluded to this earlier. Let's, let's get to it. So imagine we wanted to sort of assess the impact of you know, income effect and substitution effects on labor supply, changes in wages and changes in income on labor supply. We sort of want to run a regression of the general form. On the left-hand side, we have labor supply, so hours worked or something. We would have a constant, alpha. right? We would have post-tax wages, after-tax wages of individual I. And we also have their non-labor income, so we can get some, some impact about how changes in, in income levels affect, um, affect labor supply. We might want to control for some demographic characteristics. If we feel like people you know, with more or less education are somehow fundamentally different, maybe their labor market opportunities are different, right? Or men and women are somehow different. The way they work is different, right? The sort of labor market slot, uh, positions are different. So we want to control for some demographic characteristics. That would be our X size. The problem with this regression, right? is actually sort of buried within that last term, epsilon i. That's what we call the error term. The error term could also contain what I often call spunk, right? Someone who's really spunky. So this regression of this form, right, beta would suggest to us the impact of a change in the post-tax wage on labor supply. But I say that this, way, this regression, but naively run, is in fact kind of dangerous because epsilon subsumes within it the spunk factor, as I call it. The fact that there are folks, right, some folks out there, likely in this room, in fact, um, who are sort of just industrious, right? They're like hardworking. They both have higher wages and tend to work a lot of hours because they're spunky. They just sort of have a, they're just, you know, very spunk, spunkerific people, right? And they sort of have an industriousness to them. They tend to sort of be more productive in the office, have higher wages, and sort of work more hours. It's not that they work more hours because they have higher wages. They just sort of have both of these characteristics because of who they are. It's an unobservable individual fixed effect of being jack, right? Of being an individual of that type. There are people who sort of don't really like work. They have a, they have a taste for leisure, right? I don't think, you know, that's their, their individual pro, uh, utility functions, whatever it is, you know, no judgment about it. And they may not like work at work, right? When they're actually at work, they may be low productivity. It's not that they work few hours because their wages are low. These two things are both driven by the fact that they just sort of have different tastes. Right? So there's an individual specific effect that comes from our preferences on some level that could be contaminating this regression, giving us a false sense of the relationship, the causal relationship between after-tax wages and hours, because part of that relationship is actually due to sort of confounding factors, spunk that you sort of have people who have high wage, high hours sets and low wage, low hours sets. They're not caused by each other. They just come together. Just come together. And in that case, suppose we naively ran this regression, not thinking about spunk. 
because we have these people who have high wages and high hours just by sort of a fact of who they are, and low wages and low hours by, fact, by a fact of who they are, we would be exaggerating the causal relationship. Beta would be too high, right? It, we, would be think, we would be interpreting that as, oh, high wages lead to high hours, when in some cases it's just they come together. There's sort of a package deal for some people. And so this regression sort of naively run could be really dangerous. So what do we do? What do we do when the cross-section is sort of not helpful because there are these individual specific factors? We look for random experiments, right? Something that changed somebody's after-tax wage that doesn't have to do with the job they selected, right? That doesn't have to do with who they are and their preferences. One such example that was used was called the negative income tax experiments. So this was, um, like many things that sound very liberal, was something that Richard Nixon was really into in the 70s. Um, and the negative income tax is sort of a predecessor of something we'll talk about in a minute called the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. The negative, in so what do most ta income taxes do? They take a piece of your wage, right? It goes to the government in the form of taxes. The negative income tax experiments were an attempt to help low-income Americans by subsidizing their wages. So they earn $10 in the market, and they get $4 from the government. It was a way to sort of redistribute towards low-income people while strength strengthening their labor, their labor supply incentives, while helping them work more, right, to have greater attachment to the labor force. So that was the notion behind them. And the way they were rolled out across different states was actually kind of, uh, it helped facilitate research. They had them in some states and not in other states, and sort of it was randomly timed, and et cetera, et cetera. So that was one source of after-tax variation that was used to sort of assess the impact of after-tax after -tax wages on hours, right? That was one source. Another, another study that people, another tax people have used is um, the Tax Reform Act of 1986, which remember we looked at the rate structures before and after different tax cuts. If you recall, this one lowered the top marginal rate from like 50% all the way down to 28%. And it didn't have as much of an impact at sort of the lower end of the income scale, right? And if you recall from the example in the book about Barack and Michelle and Bill and Hillary, right? Fan, uh, couples that have um, a primary earner, an earner and a secondary earner face sort of higher marginal tax rates than, fam than couples that have similar earners, right? So TRA 86 lowered tax rates sort of for secondary earners more than sort of general earners, right? The secondary person in a, working in a, in, a spouse, in a spouse couple. So uh, you can look at sort of, you know, or, oh no, sorry, this, oh, this is, sorry, this, I guess TRA 86 lowered tax rates at the top more than the bottom. So you can look at sort of how hours work changed among people at the top of the distribution versus the lower part of the distribution because this tax act had a bigger effect at people, on people at the top versus people towards the bottom. That could be dangerous in another way, right? If you think the labor market somehow functions differently for people at different ends of the, of the income spectrum, like hours are more or less flexible for people at different points in, in, in the income distribution, or the opportunities, like demand is somehow different for these people, right? Um, then that, that could be dangerous as well, right? But these are some studies. There have been other studies using tax policy, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so what are the findings of these, um, of these studies? So this, OK, the TR86 was also used to study spousal income in a different paper. This is one paper. There's another paper that looks at how sort of secondary earners reacted to the change in tax rates of TR86. And they found that, the, that secondary earners are actually pretty elastic. So when we actually look at the elasticities people have estimated, for primary earners, the estimated elasticity hovers very close to 0.1. That's a pretty small elasticity, right? That says that if your taxes went up by 10 percentage points, your labor supply would only go down by one percentage point. That's not very elastic. On the other hand, labor supply elasticities for secondary earners are much higher. They range from somewhere between 0.5 and 1, suggesting that a 10 percentage point increase in your tax rate would lead to between, lead to between a 5 and 10 percent reduction in your labor supply. So something that's really interesting, uh, so, so when it comes to these secondary earners, of course, they're much more elastic, as we see in the numbers. And a lot of this response actually doesn't come from reducing the number of hours they work. It comes, you know, this is on average among all secondary earners. The labor supply elastic, elasticity is actually driven by extensive, the extensive margin. So by people entering or leaving the workforce um, is what's really driving this elasticity. It's not that people who are working are working more or less hours. It's that people are not becoming secondary earners or are becoming secondary earners in response to tax rates. So what's interesting, sort of, I think, um, an interesting part of this research is that, uh, you know, so whenever we're studying things with data, right? So like when you today we have great data on the early 2000s, right? Because there's always a lag between when something happens and when good quality data is available. So in the 80s, people were sort of studying the 70s. In the 90s, people were studying the 80s, et cetera, et cetera. 
And one of the interesting things is, you know, back in the day, like maybe in the 80s when people were studying data from the 70s, primary earners, right, were often just sort of, you know, this fact, this fact that primary earners were very inelastic was, you know, somewhat crassly described as middle-aged white dudes just work, right? They just work 40 hours a week. They don't respond to changes in tax rates. They're primary earners. They just work. And secondary earners were like women, right? And all women are very, very responsive to taxes. It was secondary female earners are responsive because family spousal structures for a long time were sort of of that form, right? Where a man was like the majority earnings, uh, was, uh, earned the majority of earnings in the household. And women sort of came in and out of the labor force depending on the age of children and the demands on income in the family. If you're saving for a house, you're saving for college, women would kind of go in and out of the workforce depending on sort of budgetary needs. That was like the structure and sort of there's a vernacular built around that. Like even if you look back sort of historically uh, in the 50s and the 60s, if there were sort of going to be layoffs, they would often target women in the firm because they were not the one putting food on the table for their families. That used to be legal, right? To be, that it would be a formal justification. We're going to let you go because, you know, Bob's got to, got to put food on the table in his house and you're just sort of around to, to pay for wallpaper or something, right? This is like, I mean, this was the notion, right? That women in the workforce were extra income for their families and not primary income sources. But, and so, you know, there's this notion that, you know, oh, women are a lot more elastic than men would be how this primary versus secondary earner difference would be described. But over time, we've seen these really large scale changes in the labor force, right? Women work full time at much higher rates. Men work at less than full time at higher rates than before. And we're actually seeing this convergence. When we look at the labor supply elasticities of women, they look more and more like 0.1 over time. And we look at the labor supply elasticities of men, they look still a lot like 0.1, but less like 0.1 and more like 0.5 than they used to. So it's interesting that sort of people's roles in the economy change or in the labor force change, we see this convergence of elasticities as people are sort of having similar jobs across genders and similar roles in their families as earners across genders. And I think it's a really interesting area of research right now. Okay, so that's sort of general labor supply stuff. Let's go on to what I think is actually um, a pretty interesting part of sort of tax policy, and it's the earned income tax credit. So the earned income tax credit is the largest cash anti-poverty program in the US. We've reduced the scope of cash welfare, i.e. TANF, over time, and expanded the EITC. We've moved away from cash handouts, right, towards wage subsidies, basically. Because the notion is that when we hand people a welfare check, it's sort of like triggering just an income effect, right? They have more income, they're going to demand more of everything, including leisure, so we're actually weakening their labor force attachment. The idea behind the EITC is that we want to redistribute towards low-income Americans, but we want to do so in a way that strengthens the labor supply incentives. So what the EITC does is it sort of provides a federal wage subsidy for wages earned by an individual who's low-income. So the goals of the ITC are, again, to redistribute resources. Redistribution is a key goal of the ITC. And the second piece of it is to sort of strengthen labor supply incentives, or to increase labor supply. So the way it works is that, um, so the EITC, you can get the EITC if you don't have children, but it's really, again, uh, targeted to families with children. So you get a subsidy from the federal government for every dollar you earn, depending on how many kids you have, the, the limits are different, to a certain level. Then you get the maximum amount of credit you can get for your number of children. For a while, you can keep earning income and not lose your benefit, your ITC credit. But after a certain interval of earned income, you start to lose a fraction of your benefits, a fraction of each dollar in terms of benefits for each dollar you earn. Sort of like the phase out of TANF that we talked about. Until your benefit is entirely gone, at which point you're sort of no longer EITC eligible. OK, so what are these levels? Let's go through it. Let's start down here. So an individual with no kids gets a subsidy of, it's actually 7.65 cents for every dollar they earn, up to $13,660, at which point they've earned the maximum credit of $464. At some point after, and at some point after a few thousand dollars more of income, it starts to phase out. A family with one child gets a matching tax credit of 34 cents, for every, so yeah, zero kids, 7.65 cents. One kid, you get all the way, you go straight up to 34%. So this is really targeted to families with to children. So for each dollar they earn, they get 34 cents in tax credits, up to $36,052, more if you're married. And your maximum credit is $3,094. And it's more and more generous as you go up. It's more generous in terms of how much income you can earn a credit up to, 
right? And the subsidies are larger. So it goes 7.65%, 34%, 40%. And this last tier was recently added. It's the 45% tier, founded with three or more kids. It was actually something I wrote my junior year paper about in college, was um, the child poverty impact of adding this third tier. Because Wisconsin's actually had one for a long time. And um, so the way, the sort of just a demographic fact is that child poverty is highest, child poverty rates are highest in homes with more children. So treating a family with three or more kids like a family with two or more kids is sort of not targeting anti-poverty dollars in places where there's more child poverty, just sort of on average. Um, and so this third tier was added in 2009 and um, it provides a maximum credit of $5,751, right? So this is a big, a, big a big sort of support for families. Remember we talked about TANF benefits? The average TANF, TANF benefit is roughly $400 a month, right? So, you know, $400 a month times 12 is $4,800. This is as big a program as TANF for some families. So, but again, the key is, but that, TANF, remember, went to fam that was the maximum benefit for a family with no income. We're trying to provide a, a, a cash benefit here for families with income. So what did I say? That, I'm going to get to questions in just one second. So what did I call this? The EITC was an earned income tax credit. So that offsets taxes owed. It's potentially true, and often, and often in fact true, that a family at sort of the lower end of the income spectrum, right, a family with earnings of roughly $40,000, right, or $50,000, after all is said and done, after all the deductions that are taken, after the exemptions are taken, they may not actually owe that much money in taxes, right? So their credit, their EITC, may actually exceed their taxes owed. But there are two kinds of credits. Does anyone remember the two kinds? Above the line. No, those are deductions. Yeah, those are above the line, below the line deductions. But credits come in two forms. Refundable. Exactly, refundable and non-refundable. So if this was a non-refundable credit, it would not be as effective as an anti-poverty tool, right? Because you have to owe at least this much in taxes in order to benefit from it. And the families who sort of we're trying to target frequently don't owe that much in taxes, in, in income taxes. So it's a refundable credit. If you owe few less in taxes than the credit you're eligible for in, under the EITC, the government writes you a check for the difference. It's a refundable credit. Well, in some ways, this is discussed as sort of, you know, there are taxes paid that are not on the federal income tax form, namely payroll taxes, right? And so this is, in a sense, offsetting payroll taxes to some degree. But there were two questions. Matt, do you have a question? No, oh, you had a question. I'm sorry, your name? Uh, Libby. Libby, yes. I was just wondering, how do they come up with the amount that they want to Yeah, so I mean, the numbers are, are weird, right? 7.65. So this phase out, oh, it's, uh, so you know, it's actually 21.06%. And these numbers are all, so they were set by some budget, so by some law at some point. And those numbers are set, frankly, with a budget target in mind. And then we inflate them by inflation every year, by the inflation rate every year. So they just become random numbers at this point. Yeah. But um, I want, do want to talk about the phase out really set quick, and then I'll get to, a lot, to the other question. So I said, you know, it phases in at these rates, 7.65%, 34%, 40%, 45%. That's up until this amount of income. Then for every dollar you earn, you get to keep your maximum benefit, and it starts to phase out. And it phases out at different rates. It phases out at, um, for families with one kid, I believe it's 15.98%. With two kids, it's 21.06%. Uh, I can't remember what it is for three kids. But you know who does know? The taxpolicycenter.org website. <laughs> yes, you can Google it. on. You can look it up on your phone. You can do this with your friends. Um, yes, so it's easily available. Um, there's another question. Um, right, yes, Eric. So if I'm understanding this schedule correctly, let's say the 40,000. Yeah, sorry. Oh, this is my, the, go ahead. Oh, uh, this might be easier to look. Oh, 40,964. Yeah. Exactly. So, so uh, up until no, so once you so once you reach reach forty thousand nine hundred sixty four dollars, you've achieved the maximum credit. And, and and also being married, if you're making total household income of forty six thousand. Forty four. So yeah. wouldn't that discourage people to have two incomes in a household? Because I know at forty thousand, you could each get it. It's greater than what I would get. Yeah. So yeah, this I'm is. This there is this. There's this. So uh, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. Suppose you had four kids. Right, let's say you had four kids and a man and a woman or two men and two women, and you had two adults, right? Rather than getting married and being subject to a limit of, say, even if that four kids, it would be 49,000. They might be better off not getting married, dividing the two kids amongst them, and applying for the EITC separately. Yeah, so this is a criticism of the EITC, that it has very strong marriage penalties, right? Yes, this is, the, this is a real issue. 
Um, yeah, no, I, this is actually part of, um, I, you know, this is, this is a part of, I, I often feel like this, this part of sort of anti-poverty programs or any program, tax programs when it comes to all Americans, this is sort of where economics meets social values and where my expertise runs out very, very fast. Um, and so yet, I think these are really tricky, tricky to say is this good or bad. What we can say is, wow, these are bigger marriage penalties than the than regular income tax schedule. That is something, as economists, we can do the math and we can show someone a math table and then, you know, I, then I'm done, right? That's the end of my, my, my piece. So, but yes, you're right. There are, there are it depends on the state, right? Also about how Medicaid works. And there's also this idea, um, it's been floated a few times, we have a tough budgetary situation, so the money has never really been there for it. But there's this idea that we should really strengthen this part of the ITC, the no kits, because there's sort of um, like men in the lower, in, in the lower part of the income distribution are not faring particularly well. Um, there's a lot of sort of concern that uh, there's, you know, we do a lot to help single mothers as a society and sort of there's a lot to this, this sort of imbalance among, between genders, right? And there's some notion that we should maybe be doing more to help, um, to help low income men. And uh, you know, it's not exactly, the thing is kids are cute and so they get the dollars, right? And like, you know, I'm not, you know, it's just not, things with kids just get dollars more effectively than things with adults, right? So um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a discussion that's not really borne fruit yet. Sean, do you have a question? I just found this is for the class, but can't you, so where does filing separately if you're married? Yeah, so that's the other choice. You can file separately. Um, I think so. You know, I'd have to double. You know, I can't remember. There are differences between not being married at all and filing separately. I have to, I have to check. This is like one of the things I should know and I don't know off the top of my head. But it's a good question. I'll get back to you about it. Because, you know, like while I'm talking to you, I'm also thinking about stuff. And I was thinking about this. I was like, there's somehow a difference between actually not being married and married and filing separately. I think I'll double check. I'll look it up and I'll, I'll email you guys. Let you know next week. It's a very good question. Anything else? Okay. Next slide. So this is just a graphical. So sometimes, okay. So I have to tell you this stuff. So. Not all of these numbers I've taken out of the same year. This is this year, I believe. Or this is, no, this is last year, maybe. No, this is this year. This is, this is tax year of 2011. This graph was made by CBPP. This is 2011, too. So this is, this is, I think these are all the same numbers. Yes. So these numbers come, this is all fiscal year 2011. So this is nothing but a graphical representation, right? Because what, what are we looking at here? Let's look at any one of these. Let's look at this sort of um, blue, this medium blue um, piece of it, which is for a family with two kids, right? So they get a subsidy of 40 cents on every dollar earned up until they've maxed out the credit of $5,111.12. They can continue earning income, right, and go ahead and keep that full benefit until they hit this point over here, and then they start the phase out. And it phases out at 21.06 cents for every dollar they earn after that limit, after the end of the, of the, the flat horizontal line until they get to an income level where they've, they've completely exhausted their EITC benefit and they're no longer EITC eligible. Okay, so we had a wage subsidy, then sort of no subsidy, but you get to keep the credit, then you start losing the credit. Right? This is a little bit like TANF, what we looked at was TANF. Okay, of course, you know, we look at this, of course, what am I gonna ask you to do next? Translate it into a budget constraint, right? Okay, let's do it. Okay, so our blue line is our original budget constraint. I've used a slope of 20. I'm going to be honest, that's a higher wage rate than a lot of EITC eligible um, families sort of actually receive. Um, and so we'll just use 20 as a wage rate for, for, for kicks. Okay, so that's our initial blue line. Then we're going to sort of model the EITC schedule. So there's an initial piece where we're subsidizing, right? Suppose this was a family with two kids. I said the phase in rate, the subsidy rate was 40%, right? So what's the slope of this line going to be? 1.4 times 20 is also known as, twenty-eight, right? Yep, yep. There we go. It's twenty-eight. Okay. So what is what is the effect? Okay. So let's actually do the whole curve. Then we'll talk about the income. Because it's for it's a forty percent subsidy, right? So the so you're getting forty cents in tax dollars, forty cents of tax dollars, tax credit dollars for every dollar you earn. So it's one point four. Then we have this range in here where the slope, so it starts from here to here, the slope is actually parallel, right? It's the same line because what's going on here? You've achieved your maximum EITC credit and letting you keep it for a while as you earn more money. But then you get to the phase out 
point, right? And from this point, you start losing 21.6 cents, 21.06 cents for every dollar you earn, right? And so here the slope is going to be, it's going to be 50, 60, right? Because it's going to be, um, it's going to be roughly 80% of your, roughly, right? It's going to be 1 minus 21% times, tw times 20, right? So you're getting less than your original wage through here because you're losing benefits for every dollar you earn, right? And then eventually you get to this point where you're no longer EITC eligible. Okay, now let's talk about the substitution effect and income effect on all of these ranges. Let's do the first piece. What's going on here? Is there a change in slope in this first piece? Yeah, 1 to 1.4, right? So there's a change in slope. And okay, so is leisure now more expensive or less expensive? Leisure is now more expensive, right? Because the opportunity cost of watching Law and Order has gone up, right? It's 40% higher, in fact. So is that going to want to make you con uh, Buy more leisure or less leisure? Less. less. So you're going to work, do the substitution effect, you'll work more. Are you richer or poorer than before? You're richer, which makes you want to buy more of everything, including, so you're going to want to work less. OK. What's going on here? Is there a substitution effect? The slope's parallel, right? Because that's the point where you get to keep all the money. You get to keep your full credit. So there's no slope effect, right? There's no substitution effect. You're at your original wage rate. But there is an income effect. You're richer, so you want to work less, because you want to consume more leisure. And in this range, is there a substitution effect? Yeah, there's a slope change, right? Leisure is now relatively more expensive or less expensive than before. We're, OK, so when you make these comparisons, between, you're always comparing between curves, right? between budget constraints, and not across pieces of the same budget constraint. Right? You're doing this comparison, not this comparison. OK, so let's, compare, let's look at this segment. So now you're in this piece now. Is your slope uh, flatter or steeper than before? Flatter. Leisure is now cheaper. You're going to want to consume more leisure, so you're going to want to work less. So the substitution effect will lead you to want to work less in here. Are you richer than before or poorer than before? Richer. So you're going to want to work less. OK, so let's go back and think about all those again. So up here, the substitution effect makes you want to work less. Income effect makes you want to work less. In here, there's no substitution effect, but the income effect makes you want to work less. In here, the substitution effect makes you want to work more, but the income effect makes you want to work less. So for these folks, the impact of the EITC is ambiguous, right? For these folks, it's, um, it's it work less, right? There's, there's just an income effect. And up here, it's both the substitution effect and the income effect making them want to work less. The only person for whom the EITC unambiguously makes them want to work more is the guy who is here. Right, because he has no income effect. He has zero dollars of income, right? But he does have a substitution effect that makes him want to work. His first hour of work now nets him more, right? So he's, he's going to want to work more from a substitution effect, but the income effect is zero for him because he has no income. So that's the only person in the whole graph who's unambiguously motivated to work more. OK. Now let's see. Um, let's take a look at what the empirical evidence tells us. Uh, OK, no, sorry. We're going to look. So this is, uh, so how do, we, so for the empirics, how do you actually assess the impact of the EITC? Well, different policy um, changes over the years. One back in the 80s, TRA 86. Another one as part of the 91 budget agreement of Herbert Walker Bush. And then again in the 90s as part of welfare reform. The parameters of EITC were changed. In fact, the EITC was expanded most of the time. It was made more generous. And so we use those policy changes to look at women before and after the policy change. Um, so single women with kids were affected a lot more than single women without kids. So you compare single women with kids and single women without kids before and after the policy change is one way to study the impact of the EITC. OK, so what have we found? There were a lot of studies about the EITC. And a lot of them up until very recently had very, very good news. So it looked like a lot more women started working. They were pushed into the workforce by the expansion of the EITC. We just went through how for most people who are working at all, right? given that they were working, the impact of the EITC is sort of ambiguous at best on, on hours worked. For many people, it's to decrease hours worked. Shockingly, the expansions of the EITC, they have pushed women into the workforce, into, into working, but they oddly have not had a real effect on hours conditional on working. Odd, right? You know, I can't tell you why exactly that is, but you know, I could imagine there being a story that when someone hears about the EITC expansion, they know it pays more to work now than it used to. So they might want to join the workforce and start working. 
But as you know, that graph was hard for us to draw, right? Let alone think about without the graph, right? For viewers sort of thinking about how much you work, it could be a little complicated for someone to figure out exactly how many hours to work to maximize their EITC. It could also be, like we talked about with, with many people, that jobs come in particular sizes. It's very hard to tailor your hours to, make, to maximize your EITC benefit, right? So it just could be that somehow it's actually complicated to do and difficult to actually do, um, to actually adjust your hours in light of the EITC. For whatever reason, we don't see an hours difference. Very interesting. Um, we do see some reductions in labor supply among married women, right? Because those women are more likely to be in that phase out range if they're married, right? Their spouse is providing some income, right? And so they're more likely to be in the, in the phase out range. So that's the one place we do see some hours changes is married women. Um, and fathers really have no effect. Uh, we see no change in fathers, right? For whatever reason, men don't seem to really, um, in, in households that, that have, uh, where people, where there's a father and a mother, we don't see the men reacting to the ITC very much. It could be that somehow they're less productive at home, so the opportunity cost of them working is somehow lower, right? Um, they could just work different kinds of jobs, right, where their hours are far less flexible, so they can't change their hours at all, right? There's, there's you know, it's, it's difficult to, to sort of sort it out from the data we have, but this is sort of the pattern of things we found. Um, there are some newer studies on the ITC that are suggesting that it may not be quite as effective as we think it is. Um, there are these researchers who have a very large universe of tax returns, and they're finding like certain patterns of sudden self-employment that seems to vary in this way that, you know, if your neighbors do a lot of it, you do a lot of it, that seems a little odd. You know, there's some interesting patterns that they're finding. Um, that stuff is really pre preliminary, but there's sort of a new wave of EITC research that's being done now that maybe suggests a story that isn't quite as rosy as the old story. Um, and that stuff will come out sort of in the next couple of years, I think. Something to look forward to. OK. I want to talk a little bit about optimal tax. Jesus, OK. OK, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to finish this next time. 